Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Emmy Rossum to talk all about her series, Angeline. And I wanted to start by talking about a lot of the early work you did in terms of character development, because, you know, in, in producing and starring in the show, you haven't just been working on it since you knew that you were going to play this role. You've been working on this character for years and doing a lot of meticulous work, it sounds like, with your acting coach, with various movement coaches, to really find all the different elements of playing this character, um, you know, even to the point of going in for a pitch meeting and coming in as character and, and people thinking that maybe it was actually the real Angeline walking into the room. And I was so interested in, you know, the depth of that process before you even knew that the show was fully greenlit in kind of like how far you wanted to go in terms of finding all of the different elements of her voice, her physicality, you know, even working with a team to create that physical look. Oh yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, it was kind of, yeah, the way you describe it is correct. It felt like Everest to turn yourself into another person, a real life, living, breathing human being, and then to play them not just at one era, but from 17 to, she wouldn't like me saying this, but 70 something. And somebody that looks and presents and sounds completely different than you was a uh, a dream and also a terror. I mean, it's terrifying to, to raise your hand and, and, you know, and, and some of, of what I think gave me the confidence was the idea that it did feel so um, almost unattainable, unreal. Every actor has a dream of playing something. And this usually doesn't happen. It usually just lives in that small part of your heart where you never get to realize it. And so I suppose in, years of, of working on it, developing it, working with writers, you know, pitching it, selling it, having a writer's room, getting shut down, getting a second writer's room, like just, just staying after it. I suppose as I started to kind of get this material and started to kind of do my research, I was almost doing the role as if I didn't know I would ever get a chance to do it. So every day in, you know, my rehearsals really, which lasted honestly for years, I turned down work in order to sit in my house and work on this on the off chance that I would get the chance to like put me in coach. So yeah, pouring through hundreds of hours of videotape, analyzing every little nuance, flourish, walk, working with the Barbie doll who is, you know, Angeline's idol, looking at the linear movement of how that Barbie works, how it, it can't do this, how it it can't lift its its knee to step. And how would that feel like to do that? And then working with that body as it changes and as she changes her body um, surgically over the years, how does that, how does that tissue feel? How, how does that feel in your body? Why do you want to be out of your body? Where does what is that emotional humanity? She says she's looking to live a painless existence that in and of itself conveys such depth and such poignancy and nuance that, you know, amidst this incredibly bright pink effervescent performance art is this tremendous poignancy and tenderness. And then getting the chance to work with these incredible artists who start to bring it to reality, right? But still the show isn't even sold and you just have the seed money and you have all these levels of like proving yourself to other people and proving yourself to yourself. Each of these artists that were in this with me, Kate Bisco, Vincent Van Dyke, Danny Glicker, they would tell me this was the hardest thing they had ever done. They weren't sure they could pull it off. And I felt the same way, but we were kind of all in it together. And, and that last, you know, last hurdle, the pitch meeting, I just felt like any kind of script or visual presentation, I think we were all did not feel like, even if you play the music and do like, you know, show little kind of, you know, model sets and things, it just doesn't bring the magic. This woman has a power of kind of transforming any room she walks into. She's this incredible combination of like childlike magic and then seducing and tease, but entirely in business control. Um, but camp and poignant too. So it, it's this bizarre. And I just thought, you know, what if we just, what if we do the pitch, but I call in sick and then don't show up. And then at the last minute, I come in and basically do improv and take over the meeting as she would. 
right? Like as this, I'm coming in as Angeline to, to bless this production. I'm going to give you all pink crystals. I had peacock feathers. I was tickling the executives from peacock with the peacock feathers. I did like a whole thing. And yeah, and we got the green light. And obviously, you know, our director, Lucy Cherniak and Allison Miller, did, everyone had just done their thing and I guess knocked it out of the park anyway. But I just thought how fun, you know, even if we don't get the green light, at least we got to really do the performance. And it was just, it was, you know, it was the first time that I put on the whole look and the prosthetics and was out kind of in public in it. And it, it was kind of an otherworldly experience because to feel the kind of attention that you get, but also the power that being in that kind of body gives you. Um, people are almost like overdosing on the femininity. It's like too much woman. And it's weird because being in like a hyper feminine body, it, it, it's almost um, it's almost a weapon weaponization of sexuality and feminism in that way. Um, and a protest, pro protesting the patriarchy in her way. Um, and it was kind of the first time that it really clicked for me. Right. You know, and to that point that you were just making about that play on, on femininity, and it feels like she really takes that aspect of like how women are told, like, you should talk like this, you know, your voice should be more high. This mm -hmm. is how you should talk to men. And this is how you, you know, you're there to seduce them. And that she really takes it and like understands how to use it to her advantage and how to weaponize it when she needs to. And I think that was one of the really fascinating aspects to watch in your performance and, and who she is as a character in the show. Um, you know, and I was interested in how that really shapes so many scenes for you because it doesn't matter who she's in a room with she's so perceptive at reading what it is that they need from her what it is that they want understanding the questions or compliments that are going to get her that thing yeah she knows that people are going to under underestimate her in every room that she walks into um and then she's she's ready she uses it um to get what she needs in that moment and and even though some people might see kind of this two-dimensional image, which is what she wants. She wants to be a mystery. She wants to be whatever you want her to be within the things that she says, like fame is survival. There is, or the myths that she tells, I'm an alien from outer space, right? There, if you, if you really hook into them, you can find the emotional truth in them and, and that grounds every moment. And also what's so fun is even though she's this kind of, feminine power at every age, right? We see that that she doesn't ever find shame in her femininity, in her body, in any age. And I think that that's something that was certainly we were looking at that being like, wow, that is confidence we don't have. But also what I loved was harnessing all the sounds that she makes. She seems to really, at least, you know, our version of the character, what my way of connecting to that is that there's this kind of like childlike magic and these vibrations that you, that she finds in her body and these punctuations and flourishes. So whether it's, you know, the pose or this pose or that pose or like, oh, 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 right? whatever it is in that moment, it's like she has her own language and her way of expressing vibration in her body. And for me, that was like a, a grounding in anxiety that if something was feeling like too much, there was a way to kind of discharge energy. And so I think that finding ways to emotionally explain and like almost like find a language and dictionary for all the different modalities of expression with the character. So they didn't feel like performance. It felt like a way to emotionally connect either to myself or to disconnect from whatever's happening if it becomes too assaultive and too much. Um, it was just an incredibly, I mean, I could, I could keep working on it. The, the show is out and I could keep thinking about it because I just, I, I just am so fascinated by everything that comes with it. And it's also so fascinating that, you know, I think it was when you you met with her before making the show that she made that point of I'm a mirror, you know, people see what they want to see. And I thought that you really 
took that on board because there's different versions of who she is and different ways that she plays to situations based on who's the person that she's sitting across with, you know, who's the other person in the room, um, you know, and so how did that really come into play in a lot of the interpersonal dynamics that you were creating within the show of just looking at the performance that the actor across from you is giving you and how you wanted to mirror back certain elements to them as well? Yeah, I think that that playing a role not only in the scene with the other person, but also depending upon who is in control of the narrative at that point in the story, because our, our story is told through a series of talking head interviews and the character changes based on who is perceiving them or kind of pitching them to the audience. And that was really interesting. So the careful calibrations there. And also the, the Angeline, you know, before she was fully formed, when she's 17 years old, developing that character, somebody who is yearning to be out of her body, for whom survival, fame is this thing that will mean that impermanence, that, that will mean permanence in an impermanent world, that will mean that she matters, that she's loved, that she is validated, that she exists really creating that character from little kind of glimmers of threads that I could connect to the, the older character that, that I have so many hundreds of hours from, but I have almost nothing to go on, on on the before. So that character, finding the physicality there and also seeing how she's playing at, at, and survival, what, what survival means to her, how she's expressing herself, how she is kind of yearning to find her feminine power too, um, and how she ultimately escapes into a world of fantasy and performance. And she really is the embodiment of Los Angeles, a place where you can play pretend forever, where you can become whatever you want, where you can really where the impossible is possible. Yeah. And in, in looking at who she was when she was younger, it's such a fascinating thread because her own relationship with her backstory and with her history is so different to most characters because anytime there's any, you know, mention of anything from her past that's truth, there's a deflection from that. It's, you know, this, this is who I am. This is who I've created myself to be. And that's the truth of the world, you know, not what you're saying. And, you know, there's moments where like, she kind of shuts down a little bit when people start to bring the truth to the foreground. And so how did that influence the way that you were building her, her as a character? Because obviously her backstory and her history, trauma that she's had still influences her and shapes her and is so much of how and why she becomes Angeline, you know, this artist and this character. And at the same time, it's so much more of an undercurrent than being on the surface for her. Well, I think that engine and that sensation of sorrow and being trapped in your life, in your body, in your identity, that, and that refusal to succumb to that to say, I am going to separate from that. I'm going, that's not, that's not me. Um, that's a fascinating thing for me. The, the, the idea that you can embrace a new narrative and that, that idea of identity um, was so interesting to me. Um, I suppose, you know, finding the, finding that, little girl in all of her, but keeping it so small inside. And when it starts to bubble up or people start to mention it, it gets shut right down. And sometimes you even see there's a literal, there's like a breather that's taken. It's like, a, I can't be in this scene right now. And I'm, and I, now I'm going to say something to myself and I'm in control and I'm back. Yeah. And I'm also, I was so fascinated with the etymology of the name Angeline, like why, why Angeline? What is, I'm sure it's Los Angeles, right? It's sounds glamorous. It kind of looks like Marilyn and the YN, but why Angeline? Um, and I know she's very fascinated with etymology too. She asks people their names. And so I wondered what that could mean. And of course, you know, part of the character is that it's a character, right? We're not, I'm not becoming Angeline the person. I 
get to play Angeline the myth, all of the different stories that she tells about herself and that people tell about her. And ultimately I had to break from the real person and not have to play that, but get to play my own character, right? Cause it's a, it's a show you, you're an actor. And so for me, her name broke down to Angel Y-N-E and the Y meant a fork in the road and N-E meant nay, like um, rebirth, renaissance. An angel is a messenger of God. And so I would say to myself during those moments, at a fork in the road, I am reborn a messenger of God. And then I would be able to come back. That would just go on in my head. I'm able to come back into the scene because I really think that from little kernels that I've read and heard her say, she is doing, she believes God's work. She is kind of like a prophet for joy and happiness and silliness and escapism and um, hot pink energy. And this idea that like anything is possible that you should go and be and achieve your maximum potential, your maximum self. And I think, you know, that in and of itself, that, that kind of what she's trying to spread there's kindness and love in it. Um, and so that's kind of, that was a, a motto that I held dear to my heart. And as you said before, there, there is an element of, of mythology in, in the interpretation. And it's interesting because she's someone who's so very well known, you know, and there is footage of her that you can watch. You know, I know that you bought a lot of her tapes on eBay to just like listen to the sound of her voice. And yet there's also so much that's just about people's encounters with her and, and the stories that come from that. And in figuring out a lot of the moments behind closed doors and who she was when she wasn't out in public, you know, was it really heavily informed by a lot of the front facing persona? No, because it does feel like she's someone who has truly embodied this into herself. This isn't, an, it, this doesn't feel like she puts this on when she leaves the house and becomes Angeline. It feels like that's also who she is when she comes home through the performance that you've given and, and the interpretation that you've taken. Right. I don't see her as somebody who's like Elvira or Pee Wee Herman or say Superman. I see her as Clark Kent and Superman have become one person. She has embodied this superhero power goddess feminine energy. Her voice is now her voice. Her, her, I don't think that she has jeans and a Tacoma, right? That she goes to Ralph's and like, I've seen her go to the grocery store. Like I, I know that like, there's tons of footage of her doing normal people things. And she is Angeline there. There is no other person. Um, and, and I think she speaks her truth in saying that maybe that there never was. She has always been Angeline. This is how she feels inside. She felt like a star. She knew this was her destiny and more power to her. I also love getting to see that, you know, this isn't someone who happened upon becoming well-known because of an image that they created. This is someone who really worked meticulously to create that, understood the business. You know, she understood if I put billboards up, I don't need to say what I'm selling and just selling myself and that image. And that will create a curiosity within me, you know, and then people start meeting her in the car and there's the merchandise selling and all of those aspects. And I think that you also really use the show to like capture, like, that dedication, that understanding of how the world works, how people work, and also the hustle that it took. And so what were the most important story beats for you to kind of track into the series in terms of making sure that that really came forth as well? Well, she does have this kind of Tinkerbell hummingbird energy, this kind of, I will not stop. You wonder what it would feel like if she did stop for a moment, if the idea of stopping and resting with her own thoughts, at least our version of the character, would be too challenging. Um, and so that idea of like, go, go, go. I like to be in control of the car. That kind of engine, I need to know I can escape. Those, those kinds of modalities of like fame is survival. I cannot stop till I get the love of the world. That them loving me is my survival that is what I need. That is my goal. So every single interaction is friend or foe. Are you going to help me or not? How do I get to my, how do I get there? Right. And I think that she has this way of approaching every situation with that in mind. And she's just such a smart business negotiator, right? It wasn't some rich guy that paid for the billboards. She walked into that guy's office who owned all those billboards. And she said, you've got all these empty billboards, put me on them. We'll put 
my photo. This is how I look. Look at my photo, right? People are going to look at this, right? We'll, we'll put my name and your number. People will, and, and people will then call the number. They'll be so curious. She knew the power of her image. And that was an image that she curated. Um, so, I mean, the story to, to get there is, you know, as she broke onto the LA scene in like front of this band, put up posters all over the city. And that was kind of the first taste, the idea that like, sure, the, the music, which was actually really good, fun, fun punk music, was always kind of secondary to the idea of let's capture them with an image. Let's be the image first. Um, and then that that really didn't kind of do it. And she tried acting too, that didn't quite do it. And then it was this idea of like, no, it's not something that I do. It's me, it's my energy, it's, it's my creation, it's my styling, it's this hyper curated image, which now is not a novel idea, but then was an incredibly novel idea. Um, and have done with incredible confidence that is, you're like, wow, that is, that is confidence, um, you know? And so, and then she had this idea for these billboards and she's never said where she got this idea for these billboards. Although there is a great old movie called It Should Happen to You with Judy Holiday, where she puts herself on billboards and becomes famous overnight. So in my mind, and there is a kind of a slight, uh, uh, um, alluding to that in her, in her, one of her negotiation scenes, she kind of quotes that movie. So that's our little Easter egg to maybe, you know, maybe that's why. I love that detail. And you were touching upon a little bit earlier as well, that idea that there's moments within the show where we're getting the story from different perspectives and how that shaped different moments as well. And, and I wanted to go back to that because that's a, such a fascinating thing for you to have to do as a performer to be in scenes because it's not this scene's told from her perspective, this scene's told from this person's perspective. It's really, there's moments where literally it changes perspective partway through or within a scene, you know, all of a sudden we're paying a little bit more attention to the way that another character is watching her in that particular moment. Um, and so how was it it, you know, obviously there's moments that it's very clear in terms of the script where that perspective is coming from. Um, but what was kind of like the more nuanced version of just really, she's always being watched. She's always being observed by people and how that influenced a lot of those inflections. Well, you know, the interesting thing is Angeline never really specifically corrects any of the false narratives out there about her. Um, except when it comes to ownership of, of the billboard idea. Um, and I, what I think is so brilliant about her and what kind of functions in the story is, it's not until somebody gets too close to something that she's uncomfortable with that she shuts it, shuts it down and takes control of the story and takes control of the narrative. And we use a lot of her own words, the real life human to influence or, or put, make our dialogue so that we give her a seat at the table in this show and she can have control of that narrative. Um, because, and the reason that she doesn't shut it down in, in most of the cases is because she knows that people are talking about her and that she knows the stories and the myths that they tell about her, even if they're not accurate, are really fueling the tumbleweed of her fame, which is the end goal. She knows that you kind of need this crowdsourced narrative of people talking about you in order to achieve that goal, which I think is so brilliant. Yeah. I also really love that there's that juxtaposition of you playing scenes that are happening within the moment and then also getting to look at Angeline as an interview subject throughout the series as well, because those are two very different dynamics again, because it's who is she when she's unguarded and, you know, not aware of being watched and who is it when she's meticulously choosing every word of how her story is presented. Um, so what did you want to make sure to bring forth in those moments where it's, you know, Angeline closer to the present day being interviewed? Well, I wanted to survive as the actor in that um, because that was our first day. We started shooting, we shot six weeks before the pandemic and got shut down. And then we picked up 18 months later. Um, and the Talking Head interview was, uh, it's the framework that goes through all of the episodes as kind of Angeline tells her story directly to us. Um, and it was, it was scripted as a 22 page monologue and it was Herculean just in terms of 
learning it, um, figuring out what the prompt question may have been that was not scripted. So we had to kind of figure out what that would be and showing the humanity, but, but also you have to realize that this is a person that does not want to be human, does not, that wants to be opaque. So, right. So it's, it's finding that like, she wants to be a myth. She wants to be an icon. She want, does not want to be you know, the idea of like, I'm not a woman, I'm an icon. So how do you find the nuance and find the humanity and vulnerability in that? Um, someone who's like raging against that idea. Um, and, and then just physically doing that, right? The makeup on those days for the contemporary look was seven hours. I had two contacts in each eye, a scleral, which is about that big to color the outside whites of my eyes and then a blue contact underneath. And you're just absolutely covered in seven hours of paint and tape and latex and contorting your body into this kind of very posed, uncomfortable position because she's so kind of conscious about how she would look in that moment. Um, and every moment is a pose and, and making sure you're in your right light. So it was, I mean, I remember getting up after doing that 22 page monologue a number of times. And I remember just blisters under the latex and like a growing sty in my eye. And, you know, your voice gets really, your voice gets so tired from just doing that all day long and, and all the punctuation that comes with that. And I remember I was two or three months postpartum and I laid down on the floor and just like, just cried, was just like simply so wrecked, just physically and emotionally by our director who directed that, Lucy Cherniak, was so incredibly in it with me. And she was sometimes doing the prompts and my movement coach was there and everybody was there. And, and it just felt like, it felt like, you know, they felt like we were doing something truly wacky. We didn't know if it would ever make it on air. And we're very, we're very gr grateful that it did. I mean, it, it definitely paid off. And then, you know, in, in the tonality of the show as well, it really feels like there's so many different ways that we get to step inside of Angeline's mind and the way that she views the world. And even, you know, oh, I'm a spaceship from another planet. And we get to see what that looks like. We get to see what it looks like when she steps into a car and it takes off from the ground, you know, because that's how she's imagining the world in that moment. Was it because you'd spent so long with the character and really understood the internalized aspects of where everything came from and, and what that worldview was, was it fairly easy to find the tonality of those scenes and how to take the audience outside of the fourth wall of, of kind of the regular telling of the story? Or did you have to kind of play around to figure out what those moments were going to look like? It's just finding that, that levity, that reaching, that knowing I think that that just feels good. That feels right. And I think that kind of pink softness and escape, almost like an out-of-body experience, um, that idea that you are both connecting to something that is magic and possible and it's just magic. I mean, flying cars and dance numbers and you're just escaping your body, that your body and, and being alive is painful and fraught and full of sorrow and death and fear. And if you can go to this place where cars can fly and you can become famous and get the love of the world, that feels better. And it was that kind of like, just kind of opening up your, your mind to that. And I, I found it, I suppose I found it um, easy to find in those moments because when you think about how much, you know, the brighter the photograph, the darker the negative, when you think of like the sorrow and the pain of being alive, of how she like rising like a phoenix from the ashes, what she's leaving behind in those moments. I think that it makes sense you would want to be there. And it would make sense that that being there, up there in the spaceship, in space, in a pink landscape with pyramids and a colorful sky would be alluring and could be actually quite um, um, 
I suppose, hypnotic and your ability to draw other people on that ride with you. She's kind of like the Wizard of Oz and also like Oz itself, right? Because she is this magical thing that could take you to this place, but she's also like behind the curtain doing it, right? And is like, don't pay attention to the woman behind the billboard. So it's really, it, it, she's quite, but I found her to be quite magical too. When I was with her, there's like simultaneously this like incredibly lofty, kind, um, magical person that makes all these funny sounds and can just make an ordinary dining room seem heightened and somehow magical. Um, and then, you know, there's also like a very shrewd with it person that gets it and can talk about Alan Watts and philosophy and 1960s thoughts um, of what the world is and how you should live your life. And I just think she's a very interesting um, combination of things. Yeah, no, it's such a such a fascinatingly complex character in terms of all the different facets. And I think that you did such an astounding job in bringing that all to the foreground in your performance. It was so amazing to watch. Thank you so much, Emmy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you.